Hello, and welcome to another episode of Just Wicked with KSP RP1. Uh, yes, I did say RP1, uh, so let's start with that. Uh, because there's a new version of uh, programs and large complexes, which is what was RP2, and it got merged with the RP1 branch. Uh, so I, I was looking at, uh, I went into the kit page, so there was a new version and uh, saw the words not safe game compatible. I was like, eh. because if you remember uh, at first when we, the very first episode when uh, we looked at all of the programs, like the late game programs didn't have any contracts in them. Uh, so I was like, okay, yeah, well, uh, hopefully we will be able to update this eventually. Uh, but then I realized that they were talking about not uh, compatible with previous RP1 saves. Uh, because back then, our RP2 was uh, just an experimental build uh, that was not uh, always... Like, you could install RP1 without the programs and large complexes. So now it has been merged. Uh, I don't know how I feel about it, that because uh, uh, I've stated previously, previously maybe the whole format of, of uh, programs and launch complexes uh, is a bit more restrictive when you want to do something such as a challenge of always using a, a winged uh, spacecraft or trying to do an orbital launch without any avionics on, that kind of thing. Uh, so let's see how that develops. Uh, but it's good to know that it's being uh, upgraded and uh, now we have uh, pretty much... Well, we do still have some work in progress, but they still have... Uh, they already have some contracts. Before, like, anything... I think Mars and Venus surface export, uh, well, maybe not surface, but uh, Mars and Venus had contracts. I don't know if surface or only orbit, but they had them. And now we even have like Mercury landing, which is ambitious, and even Plutonian landings, uh, very ambitious. Uh, these they give you a lot of time to complete. I also like that you can now see graph of the funding. So this is the funding, how the funding uh, goes down after, if you exceed the deadline. Which, um, if you recall, I was unsure about this uh, when I was deciding whether or not to get rid of the uh, space planes program. Which, uh, yeah, maybe that was a mistake. Maybe not. Uh, no sense in going about that now. So another thing we need to do is uh, some of our leaders retired, and uh, it was only three, so I think also the new uh, save kind of removed some of them. Uh, but I will say, don't worry, uh, I made a new KSP install with the new version of RP1, and just uh, copied the persistent file from uh, the save, so if things go screwy, uh, there was something that a real realism overhaul was also um, upgraded, and uh, there are some changes that would affect like uh, pro well spacecraft already in orbit, uh, based basically also with regards to fuel ratios and such. Uh, now we only have a couple, and it doesn't matter if like they've served their purpose. So it wasn't really a game-breaking thing if uh, they would have disappeared. Uh, I did have to rebuild the rocket we were building, uh, adjusting for the fuel ratios. But uh, yeah, just in case there's any problems, I have the old uh, install with the save file available if we have to go back to that. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, quickly over like our options and uh, make a decision there, and I'll just come back with a decision. Okay, all set. So for Chief Designer, we have uh, gone with Arthur Valentine. Um, it was between him and Werner von Braun, uh, because this was very attractive, 10% speed for researching all technologies. But uh, the second uh, 
Pro was with Hydrolux engines that were not there yet. And we had a 7% decrease of uh, vessel integration bullet and recovery time, which I mean, it's not so bad, but it was still an issue. And uh, Valentine gives us a uh, 10% integration of uh, rockets using a uh, kerosene or HTB, which uh, we have. 5% uh, speed to vessel integration in general, uh, roll at the rollback as well. And the negative is uh, integration speed of solid rock, solid fuel rockets with more than 500 liters of propellant, which we're not using. So no real downside there. Uh, Gene Kranz for flight director. Uh, most of these didn't have any effects because we don't have any well, we do have astronauts, but we're not training them or anything. Um, but he does give us a uh, reputation from contract rewards, more reputation. And 5% uh, speed for rollout, uh, which, I mean, it's not... Rollout tends to not be that... Uh, that long, but still, it's nice. And yeah, it will cost us 5% more to... Uh, to train our crew, but we're not doing that, so no downside there. And as far as the contractors, we went with Foki Bay 52 for 5% uh, uh, increase in uh, engineer efficiency gain for the launch complex. And uh, we will have to pay 10% more for hiring uh, any employees, be it engineers or researchers, that we're maxed out at the moment, so we might not need to have to do that for a while. So maybe updating the R&D center would be a, a good idea sometime soon. Uh, then JPL gives us a 10% integration speed of instruments. I'm not sure exactly what counts as an instrument. Uh, so yeah, this may not be so useful in the end, but there weren't that many great options to be honest. I was really trying to avoid anything where we lost reputation, uh, like these ones. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of pros that didn't apply to us, so solid uh, rocket uh, techs. Uh, this one was uh, good, but then uh, minus 10% speed for researching all techs. I really don't like to uh, reduce my uh, research speed, so maybe I should at some point. Um, yes, we might switch to uh, Douglas soon for the materials node because uh, we will need a, a couple of materials node before researching space planes, which will give us like the ability to actually have a manned program with my current uh, challenge. Uh, and rocket iron for the other contractor, uh, just. Uh, uh, Gives an, a boost for uh, orbital uh, rocket tech. Uh, well, like early rocket tech, both uh, orbital and. Uh, we do lose uh, some program funds, but uh, we're actually making a lot of money, so I'll talk about that next. Uh, so if we go here to upper. Wait, combined. Uh, did I not? Ah, that didn't take. Um, okay. Oh, no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, so I started upgrading the tracking station. We'll see, it's almost at 10%. Uh, and I think I also want to upgrade mission control because you're actually. Okay, yeah, that. The new contractors took a big chunk out of this, but we're still making a lot of money. Uh, 484 a day, and we're already uh, almost at 100,000 uh, funds, which is very good. Uh, technically, I need a upgraded mission control and tracking station to do flight planning to the moon. But if you remember my challenge, I will do the math myself. So technically, I don't need to do that as uh, basically it allows you to use the maneuver nodes, which come with the stock game. I also don't know how that works with uh, Principia, because it has its own maneuver nodes. But let's say maybe that might be a bit cheaty, so I'll 
upgrade this as well. Um, how much will it cost though? So it will cost half of our daily funds, but I think it's worth it. So let's already go. So that means we're not upgrading this anytime soon, or at least until this finishes. Uh, because, yeah, that's... Ah, I, I thought it was going to be more. Okay. Um, enter. But yeah, it, it, it will put us in the negative. No, I know. No, no, not quite. Um, okay, so I'll fa uh, fast forward until we get to launch the Data 3. Oh, yeah, uh, and that will be for the Atmospheric Analysis Satellite and Sun Synchronous Orbit Satellite. Okay, so here we go. Uh, similar profile, launch profile to the previous launch. But this time it's uh, going to be a bit more retrograde in its orbit. So we... Let me show you the contract uh, requirements. Specifically we're talking about this. We need an inclination between 95 and 99 degrees. And it's actually something I want to talk about. So while the rocket goes up. Because uh, sun synchronous orbits are actually quite interesting. So, let's suppose you have an Earth observation satellite, and uh, in most cases, it depends a little bit of what kind of uh, wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum you're using the, you're doing the observation, let's say, uh, you're going to be relying on the light that is being reflected uh, by the sun. But obviously that depends on the time of the day. So let's say you want to get as much light as possible, uh, so you want your satellite, ah, satellite to be doing the observation at local node. So right now that uh, the sun is over there, that sounds like stage separation. Basically you want a polar orbit that goes like this, so that you're looking at pretty much the entire uh, planet at some point, and just as the planet rotates below you, you're looking at every point at its local node. Which is the ideal. But, yeah, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, the Earth moves along its orbit. Okay, this is not as easy to see in Principia because it doesn't have the full orbital circle. But let's say initially your orbital plane is like this, facing towards the Sun. In one quarter of the year, the Earth will be here, and the orbital plane will be here. So your satellite will be uh, always at the terminator line, and not with the ideal conditions for the observation. So yeah, you lose observation time like that. Fortunately, there is what uh, uh, Scott Manley referred to as the Fat Earth Theory. No, this is not flat, fat, F-A-T. Uh, and, well, not really a theory, pretty much established fact, it was just spoken fun at uh, flat earthers. But, it turns out the Earth is not a perfect sphere, but it's a little bit uh, squished in at the poles and a bit fatter at the, uh, at the equator. Now, what happens is, let's say you have the orbit around here. When you're this close to one body, you can't really just treat the Earth as a point mass source uh, for uh, for orbital mechanics. It's a good approximation, but there are some variations. And while you're around this point in the orbit, the uh, the gravity vector is actually not towards the center, but a little bit shifted to the side. Uh, so now, if you put if you have a perfectly polar orbit, that doesn't uh, do anything. But if you're slightly shifted, what happens is that while you're passing close to the poles, that shift in the uh, gravity vector means that it essentially acts like a bit of a delta V applied to the normal of the orbit. 
And so basically that uh, starts uh, shifting the inclination a little bit. And then in the south, it will push it in uh, another direction. So that doesn't change the inclination per se, but kind of makes it uh, the plane which you're orbiting shift. And if you get the right uh, like orbital parameters, you can match this shift with the period of the Earth around the Sun, so that as you move around, the plane shifts in a way that it always maintains the same orientation to the Sun. So it quite, can be quite useful for Earth observation, or also if you have a satellite with a low battery power, you launch it around the terminator line, and as it shifts, it's always within uh, sunlight. It never goes into the shadow of the Earth. Okay, enough kicking out. Uh, seems like first and quarter stages were nominal, 346 kilometers uh, apogee, which will become our perigee, and we need a minimum of 256 here and 300 here, so perfect. Um, oh, and something we have to do. We have to force run here for the uh, atmospheric analysis satellite. Uh, so we don't, won't get any signs for this, but it's just a requirement. Um, oh, did I remember? Yes, okay, I did post the mass spectrometer because we're still missing this for uh, upper atmosphere. So I think I'll just put it in uh, in the rockets and slowly we'll chip away at that uh, science. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say how much long it's left because we're not in the situation anymore. Okay, uh, stage ignition, uh, upper stage ignition, everything seems nominal. Uh, I did forgot to mention, so uh, the even let's quote unquote uh, stock uh, version of um, realism overhaul does not model, uh, or uh, rather models all the plants and everything as point mass sources. So technically in those, uh, sun synchronous orbit is not possible uh, but since there are things they just put like okay you can launch this to these parameters and it would be like launching into a sun synchronous orbit but the Pnichipia mod that I have does actually model this so it is possible to take advantage of it I, what I'm not sure is if these uh, parameters seem a little bit too loose uh, to achieve like the right uh, rate of uh, precession uh, uh, of the plane to actually count as sun synchronous, I would have to do the math on it. But um, it would be a fun thing to experiment uh, later on that we can achieve uh, more precise orbits. Uh, I'll do the math on which is the best uh, orbit to launch a sun synchronous orbit satellite to. And to do that for one of the future missions. Uh, I'll just leave the UI on for now. We're almost done with the burn. Okay, excellent. Uh, so let's see. Uh, what, what's going on here? Okay, this is just vessel complete. So here we just need to run the uh, experiments and check for stable orbit, but we're within orbital parameters. And here as well, just check for stable orbit. So I'm going to tar time warp until both of the contracts are complete. Okay, there we have it. Contract complete, contract complete, and program complete. Uh, I don't think I'll end the program right now. It's We still have a lot of funding enough to get out of it, but um, let's see what our, our options are. Uh, 
Okay, so we definitely could have gone for the fast. Uh, I don't... Ah, oh, no, yeah, I did go for the fast. Okay, wow. Uh, we really raced through that one, didn't we? Okay. Um, we're still missing a lot of funds for this, so I... Yeah, I think we can just use the funds and then focus on the uh, lunar probes. I think that's a good idea. Uh, because I do expect a lot of failures here, so maybe that's good. Um, we're almost in the positive again, this time with no chances of killing people. But, uh, like, we're already getting close to being able to do this. Um, so what, what do we have? Targeted satellites? So yeah, for this we also want the uh, research node that we are currently researching. Um, I also not like that now instead of slow, normal, fast, it's normal, fast, breakneck. <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, that's the only difference in those things. Uh, but let's actually see if we can get some other nice contracts for, for this. Oh, no. Maybe just a downrange milestone. But I mean, I feel like after getting into orbit doing this, it's... Um, so... Looks like we're going to the moon. Okay, uh, so here's the situation. Because uh, I'm writing the code that will calculate the trajectory to the moon, and I, it has to be done off-plane because our inclination is higher than the moon's inclination. I was trying to design something that uh, would have uh, like deep space control to allow me to do corrections along the way. But we need a bigger rocket than I can build right now. Like I was trying to go for a full R7, which uh, would use the best engines that we have and it was still not enough Delta V by quite a wide margin. So I've uh, queued this node up and uh, moved it up over this one. Uh, firstly, because this doesn't give me the hydrogen thrusters that I thought it would. Apparently, they're all the way over here. Uh... Well, no, uh, they're all the way over here. I don't know if that's actually plan. Wait, where the hell is it? Wait, no, there's no, it's uh, prototypes. Ah, yes, here it is, Hydrazine. Um I honestly don't know the history hypergolic, of hypergolic propellants, but I seem to remember in RP1 uh, Hydrazine being available before um, Aerozine uh, 50, this config, because this one is actually better. So, yeah, I don't know what it gives, but uh, if, it was, if that was a mistake, or it was just, or maybe I'm just not remembering it properly. Anyways. So yeah, we've got the node uh, here to build a bigger rocket, but since we don't have any contracts for the, uh, for the program anymore, which is a bit of a bummer, I expected to be able to do something else. Let's just try to do like an unguided thing that I'm not just chuck things out there. And uh, the main reason is because at least uh, I'll be able to get uh, science from uh, high Earth orbit, uh, which uh, we have some science right now, but we're already going through it. So uh, we'd better get some more going on. So let's see. Okay, so this is what I have so far. Uh, this is just a science core. I did put uh, two uh, RCS thrusters in the back to... Uh, because I had also tried like building one of... Uh, a non-guided one to see... Like what I could do with the rocket that we have right now. Uh, and the main problem was that... Uh, Like in order to get the proper delta V and everything, 
I had to rely on the uh, U2000, which had a, an insane thrust to rate ratio at the end of the burn. So trying to get into a proper translunar injection with such a high thrust to weight ratio, have the program cut it off at exactly the right time, did not seem feasible. And that's why I was experimenting with other things. But I decided, okay, if I do, uh, so I put this engine just to get a reading. Um, but with this, I can cut off the engine a bit beforehand, and then uh, I have uh, 156 meters per second, even more, because I will remove the engine uh, of corrections. So let's do the transfer stage. Okay, so this is definitely more than enough to get uh, to the moon. Uh, I don't know if with your trains, plane transfer, if that will. I mean, if I'm trying to correct the inclination, then yes, I need more. But if I'm just trying to hit it at the right point, which I think is what I'm going to try to do with this rocket, then this should be fine. Uh, we would need. Some spin stabilization. Okay, now I have 11.7 because of the fuel I have, so that's actually decent. So let's see how it looks with. Well, uh, I want. So yeah, obviously we would need a longer fairing. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. So now, because our uh, rocket didn't have any way of uh, aiming the upper stage once the engine is out, the trick here would be to plan the trajectory in such a way that the engine can point the rest of the craft in the right direction. Oh my god, what, what am I trying to do? I'm, I'm a masochist. Now, unfortunately, this is already too tall, but maybe we can just modify this launch complex a little bit for that. Now, unfortunately, I don't think Doing this would help. Yeah, twenty-seven point four still. How are we doing delta V wise? We definitely don't have enough. We need like twelve seven. So we need eight hundred meters per second more. Uh, okay. Wait. Uh, let's actually try this. Okay, we're still like seven hundred short. Hmm. What we could do is upgrade the tanks. This one is like super destructive, right? Yes. Okay, that actually qu helped out quite a bit. So probably changing the big tank. Oh, I have so many things attached to it though. We'll do the trick. Fortunately, it means there will be a lot of tooling costs for all of this. Uh, but hopefully this can become our uh, geostationary transfer launcher. Let me make sure the staging is correct though. Yes, so this should make the big difference. Okay, that's definitely enough. So 
So unfortunately it will be quite expensive to get this running. And uh, I need to re uh, redo the launch complex to accommodate the extra height. Because of uh, 40 centimeters, really? So I can wait way I can make this shorter. Okay, so yeah, this should be good. Oh, I forgot experiments, I think. Get rid of this. So we, because this is going to be a flyby or impactor, hopefully, uh, we want experiments that don't take a lot of time. So we're going to do thermometer, barometer for starters, and then uh, I think it's TV camera, and I don't know which other one. So let's see. So early TV camera, 20 minutes, good. Ninety-one days, not ideal. Two hours, okay. Uh, I think this is the best option from thirty days, ninety-one days. Thermometer, yeah. Okay. Mass spectrometer, barometer. Okay, so how expensive is this going to be? Are the avionics enough though? Oh, hmm, of course. How much did that cost us about to be? Oh, okay. Hmm. Come on, it, it it says it's on the limit. Ah, what is this? Can't I tuck something in somewhere? Actually, I think I can tuck the engine. Right? Really? No, that didn't. Okay, there we go. Ah, yeah, of course, talking the engine didn't help because I. I needed to also adjust the fairing. Okay. Um, I'll run some tests and see if I commit to this or not. Right. Okay, uh, I did some tests and uh, there's a slight problem. Uh, I, even with four antennas, we do not have communications uh, all the way to the moon. And that's because the tracking station is still in the process of being upgraded. Here it is. Um, I already upgraded the antennas to uh, level one uh, communications, uh, which is the best one we have. I had forgotten to purchase that. Uh, and yeah, we're uh, upgrading the tracking station. Hopefully I won't need to go uh, for this one as well, mostly because of the time, uh, especially because lunar range communications come out. That means I should be able to reach the moon, right? And, and yeah, we don't have a lot of antennas uh, available just yet, so... Uh, I'm not going to build a rocket yet, because I'm still very unfamiliar with real antennas. Uh, apparently increasing the power to the antennas, which is an option I didn't have before last time I played this. Uh, also increases a lot the weight of it. 
So I want to uh, have the tracking station finished so that I can check because I don't see how I can see, do a simulation with a level of a tracking station higher than we have currently. So wait until this is done, do a simulation, see if we have a uh, communications, and if so, build a rocket. If not, upgrade to the antennas to the point where we can communicate, and that might mean needing another rocket because it will also mean extra solar panels for the extra power and all of that. So yeah, I'm struggling to find uh, things to do. Uh, but I don't like the idea of idling everything just until we finish uh, the tracking station. So let's go to the space plane hangar. Actually, forget about the space plane hangar. Let's just take this for a spin. Okay. Uh, let's take this off the ground. And so, you might be thinking, wait, what, so, uh, are we doing uh, World War II recreations while uh, the, uh, the tracking station is being upgraded? Uh, not quite. This does look very much like a B-38, and I'd be lying if I said it wasn't inspired by it. But it has one main difference with the B-38, that this is unmanned. Now, I am controlling this with joystick right now, just to show it off uh, for the simulation. But the idea is for this to be our first uh, unmanned airplane to test uh, airplane guiding code. So, I was trying to do this as cheaply as possible. These are the cheapest engines I could find. Uh, I ended up having to go for two because uh, we just have these very big air intakes that uh, I couldn't get them, put them and also put the landing gear in a decent place if I went for a more traditional aircraft uh, design, let's say. And uh, I also tried like going for the World War II era uh, landing gear design for most traditional aircraft that had the two main landing gears on the wings at the front and then one very small wheel at the back. But the very small wheel we have available is very, very fragile. Uh, like, I have to land at less than 50 meters per second. Which, honestly, I don't even know how fast that translates to compared to uh, World War II aircraft. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, I just want a stable aircraft that can fly at relatively low speeds to test some code and try to get uh, something to land on autopilot and or to just align itself with the runway on autopilot that kind of thing uh, so yeah this is what i came up with i had gone for uh more simplistic uh, design with uh, using the, the Derwent uh, jet engine, uh, and that thing could take off like at like thirty meters per second. It was ridiculous, like a glider with a jet engine uh, on top of it. But it was also extremely light, and uh, the Derwent has uh, thrust even when idle, so it was impossible for me to. Uh, slow down of that aircraft without having to turn it off and everything. So I decided it would be easier to just go for a proper aircraft like this. I don't ha have uh, any code yet. I think the first thing will be to get an aircraft to take off and then just land anywhere. Uh, and that's the main reason why I wanted it, for it to be able to fly very slow, that way our landings uh, are very slow, so even if they're not in the wrong way, we are less likely to break apart. Uh, yes, I'm definitely going very fast right now for this aircraft's landing speed, but let's see.
Okay, not the strongest brakes, but uh, you get the idea. So yeah, this is going to be our first drone aircraft. Uh, and I will build this one and then uh, we can uh, do some tests. In theory, I could just test all the code in simulations uh, and not have to bother with actually by building the plane. But let's just role play it a little bit and uh, build uh, the plane just as a technology demonstrator uh, for, you know, the investors, let's say. Um, but yeah, so that's going to take a while for me to learn to guide this by autopilot. Uh, and there's not much else we can do right now, so I think this is a good time to leave this episode. Um, next episode uh, we'll be doing some test flights with uh, the code and everything. So thank you very much for watching and uh, I will see you next time.